thanks very much to ShareScreen for having these talks and for inviting me on. Um, just a little quick background on myself. I am a safari guide here in Kenya. Uh, I did some training in Southern Africa at the beginning of my career. Um, and I actually train guides here now, both online and in person at various camps and lodges around East Africa. It's a passion of mine. And it's a good way for me to fill up my, my low season when I'm not busy, but it's uh, probably the most fulfilling part of my work. Um, and I quite enjoy the learning process that goes into putting presentations like this together because I've actually got to do a lot of research each for each slide just to make sure I'm getting my facts straight. Um, but I am human, so if I make mistakes or if I uh, say something that you may not agree with or, or feel is not correct, please do let me know and I'll be happy to either respond to you or, or look something up later and, and get back to you. Um, so I hope that's good. Um, this presentation is on ecology and ethology, and I'll go over what each of those are. Um, I often will separate these out, but actually they really tie into each other. And, uh, you know, animal behavior is, is very much, it very much shapes the ecology of, a, of an area. Um, and so that's why I decided to kind of put it all together here. So my first slide here is uh, you've got a picture of a, an impala and an oxpecker, a red-billed oxpecker sitting on it. And we'll go into the kinds of relationships that you may see between various species. Um, some of these pictures are not mine, and each one which is not mine will have a little uh, source at the bottom. Um, I've tried to make sure that the sources that I use are free to be shared as long as there's attribution there. So please bear with me with that. Uh, so quickly, let's talk about what ecology is. Uh, a simplistic definition is that it's a study of biotic and abiotic factors, <clears throat> their relationships, and the processes involved. Biotic factors are living things. Abiotic factors are non-living things. So we're looking at how animals and plants and insects and, and bacteria are all interacting with each other, with the water, with the climate, with the soil, the topography in an area, um, and the processes that are involved with all of those interactions. It's a very complex way to look at a system, but it's the most holistic way to look at a system um, rather than just looking at one piece, uh, at one piece at a time. Um, so we can start to break down the study of ecology into little ecological units, uh, the most basic of which is the individual. We're talking about one zebra, or in this case, one uh, bat-eared fox, an individual animal, um, not an individual species, but one particular individual. From there, we go on to a population. This is now all individuals of the same species within a particular area. So you may be talking about all the the zebras within the Kruger National Park ecosystem or within the Masai Mara National Reserve, um, those that is the population of common zebra within that area. But you're not talking about any other species yet. Next, you have a community. This is now the all the different species, living things within an area, which may be interacting with each other. So you've got some plants, you've got the various mammal species, you've got birds, you've got insects, that forms a living community or a biotic community uh, within that ecosystem. From there, you go on to the ecosystem. I know you've used that words three times so far. Um, an ecosystem is basically a self-sustaining unit uh, with both living things and non-living things, which may be closed off in a defined area of either by topography or other geological geo geographical features, or maybe just by human uh, activities such as fencing and settlement. Uh, from an ecosystem, the next step up, step up now is a biome. If we're talking about, uh, let's say, the Masai Mara uh, ecosystem, that is a, a grassland savanna ecosystem. There are other similar ecosystems within East Africa which would fit that same type 
they are all part of the grassland or savanna biome or ecoregion. Um, and so you're, you're putting similar types of ecosystems together in a, in a larger grouping. They may not necessarily be connected, um, but they are similar enough that they have the same similar types of soil, similar climate, similar uh, vegetation types and, and animals that you might find there as well. You can find the similar similarities there. And finally, you've got the biosphere. This is basically just a recognition of the fact that even though you may have mountainous forests, Afromontane forests, you may have deserts, you may have uh, the Amazon forest on the opposite side of the Atlantic Ocean, there is no way that each one of those is actually completely separated from each other. And even completely disparate um, ecosystems or biomes are still interacting with each other. So as I mentioned, uh, an ecosystem is a self-sustaining area with both living and non-living things that are interacting with each other. Um, so you're talking about the total communities within a given area, that's all the different living things, including their physical environment. So here we've got your wildebeest, you've got the water, you've got flamingos, the hills in the background, the grassland, um, and although you can't see it, Mount Kilimanjaro is in the background there. This is part of the Amboseli ecosystem. Um, now we get into the energy transfer, um, how, how energy moves up through an ecosystem. Uh, so first of all, you've got to think about the two different types of, of two different methods of gaining that nutrients or that energy. First, you've got autotrophs. These are organisms that create their own food by photosynthesis. Um, we call those producers. So we're talking about primarily about plants here. Um, and then you have heterotrophs, which are animals which, or, or species which cannot produce their own food and need to consume another organism in order to survive. So this is the consumers and the decomposers, your fungi, your mammals, your, your birds, insects, etc. cetera. Um, now, an ecosystem is a, is a complex thing and, and it's never linear. Uh, energy transfer is not linear. It's in a, in, a, in a web and I'll get to that on the next slide. But just to simply look at how energy gets in and gets out of an ecosystem and how it's transferred, um, you've got sun, energy coming for, in from the sun plus nutrients and minerals from the soil which are allowing the plants to grow. Uh, from, you need a lot of plants Let's, you know, let's say you've got an acre of land, you'll have, and, and the entire acre of land is covered in grass. You're good, that is a lot of grass, which is going to support a smaller population of grasshoppers and locusts. From there, you're gonna have uh, insect, insectivorous mammals, which will eat those, but you'll have fewer of those insectivorous, insectivorous animals than the insects and locusts, because one insectivorous mammal is gonna have to eat lots of grasshoppers in order to survive. So the higher up you go on this food chain or this pyramid, the fewer and fewer animals there are, generally the larger they are as well. And you get to your tertiary consumers and you can even go one step further to you know, quaternary or the apex predators. Um, all along the chain, you've got uh, decomposers here on the left. So it doesn't matter whether something is a producer, or one of the consumers, eventually it's going to die. It's going to produce waste, fecal matter, and urine. All of that has to be decomposed and put back into the soil uh, for the producers to be able to access. Okay, so this is a trophic pyramid. Again, this is very simplistic and not looking at the complexity of the relationships involved. This is a slightly better representation. This is a food web. Um, each animal and each plant has things that eat it and things that it eats itself. And so you've got a complex web of transfer of energy and transfer of nutrients uh, from within just on land, also in the water. It's not showing this very clearly here, but you've got lots of transfer of energy from land to water and vice versa. Um, especially as you have waste, which, which is, produces runoff, which then goes into the water, which produces nutrients, which allows for algal blooms and for 
plankton blooms in the ocean, which then allows for much more food for the marine life. Um, and here is just another representation of the same things. You've got every animal, every every uh, organism out there is either consuming or being consumed. Each one of them is producing some sort of waste. There's decomposers, which are putting all of that back into the nutrient pool, which can then be accessed again throughout. I hope that's clear. Um, so a little a concept which is important to understand and somewhat is somewhat contentious, especially for land managers who are deciding how to how to handle populations of certain animals with on their land is the idea of, of carrying capacity. This is the maximum number of individuals of a particular species that an ecosystem can sustain. So you may be a land manager on a conservancy or a national park or a reserve where you are looking at the damage that the elephants are doing to the to the landscape and you may re, you may decide that your land has reached its carrying capacity or has has gone beyond the carrying capacity for elephants and so you need to figure out how to reduce the number of elephants either by translocation or by uh, culling or by uh, use of um, contraception um, whatever the case may be if you don't change, if you don't reduce the number of elephants, you're going to see massive changes in the ecosystem. Um, the same can be true for livestock. The same can be true for pretty much any species that if you go over a particular number, uh, you begin to see major changes. And in a natural system, which is unfenced, there are natural means to bring those numbers down like starvation, disease, weather, hunting predators, et cetera. Um, now, this graphic here is actually from, from North America. I think you can see that it's got the winter, spring, summer, and autumn uh, for, the, for the Northern hemisphere. It's opposite in the Southern hemisphere and basically irrelevant along the equator. Um, but the concept remains the same is that you've got your regular breeding stock and your ca carrying capacity for long-term. Um, and you may have local spikes in numbers of impala, for instance, and but then eventually the impala will eat themselves out of house and home, and the predators will have a field day killing lots of impala because there's a surplus, and maybe there'll be a disease that'll come along and knock them back down. And before you know it, you'll go down below the normal carrying capacity, uh, and then it'll eventually come back up again. Um, one concept which gets you probably have heard before is natural selection and sort of a, a layman's way of putting it is survival of the fittest. That's quite a simplistic view, but um, in general, genes which create a hindrance or features on an animal or species which create some sort of a hindrance to survival will get eliminated over time. If, if a species is not able to reproduce, if it's not able to survive long enough to reproduce, then there is no way for that, that gene to be passed on. Um, so genes which create an improved adaption for survival are passed on. So in the case of the giraffe here, you've got those long necks, you've got that very long tongue. Those are all adaptions, adaptations for the, the lifestyle that a giraffe leads in a savanna ecosystem where they need to be able to access the leaves high on the trees. Uh, they are not competing for those for that food source with anything else other than maybe elephants. Um, and their long tongues and that very, very thick saliva allows them to swallow up small thorns and everything else without them damaging their internal organs. So all of those things are selected for because they provide an advantage. They provide them with the ability to survive better in their environment uh, rather than a, a hindrance or a negative adaptation, which would, which would mean that they would slowly start to die off. Sometimes you'll get features which don't seem to affect survival or reproduction rates at all. They may just be a random genetic mutation. And we see this with black 
uh, melanistic animals. You'll see this with leucistic animals, which are totally white. Uh, leucism is slightly different from, from an albino or an albinism, um, where there is still a little bit of melanin within the skin. That animal is still able to survive. You may see that animal several times. It'll survive to adulthood. It'll be able to pass on its genes. Um, with the, in the case of leucism, if it's a, a prey animal, let's say a, an impala or, or something like that, that animal may actually stand out more to a predator and will be more likely to be killed by that predator. If for some reason, maybe there are not that many predators around, that animal will survive and will be able to pass on its genes. And then you may begin to see more and more of those white impala around or in Kenya, here in central Kenya, around Kipia, we get leopards, which are melanistic, and there's a few of them now. And when they mate with normal spotted leopards, uh, you'll see that some of their cubs are black and some of them are spotted. And the next litter, you may get some which are totally spotted or some which are totally black. Um, but basically, that doesn't, that black coloration doesn't confer any hindrance on the leopard, especially if they are hunting primarily at night. And so you'll see that that is passed on. Whether it's a positive thing or negative thing is unknown to us at the moment, but time tells. Um, within that natural selection, you may also, you may see two different types of adaptations. Some species may be very specialized. They, they will, they really become experts or specialists in a particular kind of ecosystem. They have very, very specialized, narrow range of diet. Um, a good example of this is a cheetah. Uh, quite often people will say that cheetahs have reached their evolutionary bottleneck or their evolutionary end because they've specialized so much. They can only hunt in open grassland and, and savanna, maybe light woodland. They have to have pretty flat ground. They've got to have prey size, which is exactly the right size. Um, and they're not able to fight off any other predators to, that may want to scavenge their food. So they are super, super specialized. They're very, very good hunters, um, but there's everything else is stacked against them. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you've got the other big spotted cats, which are the leopards which can survive in savannah, they can survive in forest. They've been found, a frozen leopard has been found in a, a, a glacier at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. They would traditionally have been found all the way down to the coast in the forest along the coast um, and walking along the beach. You'll find them in cities, you'll find them pretty much anywhere. And they are able to feed on anything from rats to birds, to dick dicks, to wildebeest, and they and even up to, to giraffe. So they're not picky. They'll take whatever they can get, and uh, they can survive in all sorts of different environments. So they are very much generalists, and so they have been able to thrive. And despite the fact that there's been lots and lots of habitat loss, and other species may be disappearing, leopards are slightly less at risk. It's not to say that they're not at risk at all. They definitely are, but uh, not nearly as much as cheetahs, for example. Um, and then quickly, just uh, a note on uh, this concept of keystone species. I mentioned this a little bit with the elephants, that uh, a keystone species is an individual species that has a larger than life or larger effect on their ecosystem than most others. If you were to remove a cheetah, from an ecosystem, but you still had leopards and lions and wild dogs um, and hyenas, you would probably not see a massive change in that ecosystem because the, the other animals would, the other predators would take the place of that cheetah and would continue to hunt the same prey. If you were to take termites out of an ecosystem, on the other hand, you would see huge change. Uh, termites are extremely important for recycling nutrients, for breaking down dead and decaying matter. Uh, the, the moisture within their gut and the flagella within their gut breaks down that organic matter and puts it into the soil. Uh, the termite mounds that they create are massive, massive things for which provide homes for all sorts of different uh, 
other animals from birds to mammals to reptiles. Um, and if you suddenly lost all the termite mounds in an ecosystem, you would suddenly lose hope for all of those species as well. And then you've got aardvarks, which dig up termites, and aardvarks create massive holes, which also make, uh, which also create homes for lots of species, warthogs, porcupines, uh, all various mongooses, uh, aardwolves, and everything else live in aardvark holes. And so if you were to suddenly get rid of termites, you would potentially lose lots and lots of other different species as well. And the dead and decaying matter in that ecosystem would also have no way of breaking down. In a dry land ecosystem, termites are extremely important. In a forest ecosystem, the moisture in that ecosystem helps to break things down as it is, but you'll still find plenty of termites there. Elephants are another example. Um, elephants can really change an ecosystem. The larger number of elephants you have, the more and more trees you'll see disappearing. Uh, the fewer elephants you have, the more you'll see woodland and forest coming back. Um, there's a, it's important to have a cycle of elephants moving through an ecosystem, opening things up, moving along, allowing things to regenerate and coming back again, uh, rather than just being fixed in a particular area with a fence around it where they knock down everything and it never has a chance to regenerate. I've got sycamore fig there as well. If you've ever watched, uh, there's a really good documentary called The Queen of Trees, which uh, outlines just how much life the sycamore fig is able to support. And sycamore figs are also extremely important on river systems for holding the soil in place, uh, holding the nutrients in place, and kind of regulating that ebb and flow of a river so that it doesn't just go from drought to flood. Uh, so sycamore figs are massive. Uh, they're very important keystone species in, in an area. Um, let's move on to some behavior. And this focuses primarily, I'm going to focus primarily on mammals, uh, but there will be some mentions for, for birds and reptiles and insects as well. So ethology, very similar to ecology, but ethology is the study of animal behavior. Somebody who studies animal behavior is called an ethologist. Um, and there's several purposes to, to ethology. We want to know what an animal is doing, when it's doing it, where, how, how frequent, how often. But most importantly, we want to understand why. Uh, once you understand why, then you can begin to really understand that animal's uh, place in an ecosystem and its, and its hierarchy, its social structure, um, and, and the general life history. So, I've got elephants fighting here. What are they doing? There's two males which are fighting. Um, they're doing it in the middle of the day. Why are they fighting? It's probably two young males who are sparring with each other, trying to learn techniques for fighting. They're testing their strength. Um, it's, it's not really play fighting, um, but it's also not a serious fight over a female. You can see the one on the left is considerably smaller than the one on the right. But he'll be learning some very valuable lessons from this interaction. OK, so symbiosis, um, depending on where you look, there's different definitions for this particular uh, term. Some will mention it specifically as two organisms which are benefiting each from each other. That's a symbiotic relationship. But symbio basically just means two animals. Bio, bio means life. So the two organisms which are living together and are interacting with each other. Okay, so we've got different types of symbiotic relationships. The first and most well known is mutualism. This is where both organisms benefit from a relationship. The classic example in a savanna ecosystem that most guides will talk about will be the buffalo and the oxpecker. Um, the oxpecker lives or, or likes to sit on buffalo and other large uh, herbivores and pick off ticks. Oxpeckers like to eat ticks because ticks on, on herbivores are full of blood and oxpeckers like to eat that. They need to get that iron and the protein from the blood within the tick. Now, when they pick all the ticks off the buffalo and there's now no longer enough ticks on them, they're going to start actually opening up little wounds on the buffalo. 
and eating the blood directly from the buffalo. That now moves away from a mutualistic relationship. They're no longer benefiting that buffalo. That buffalo is going to find them painful and a hindrance and could potentially be opening the buffalo up and exposing the buffalo to disease. So it's not as simple a relationship as many people might think. Other examples would be bees and flowers. The bees are pollinating the flowers. They're able to access the nectar, and then they're going to take the pollen over to the next flower for the, for the plants to be able to reproduce. Uh, next one, you have a commensal relationship. Commensalism is where one organism is benefiting from another, but the other one is not affected either negatively or positively. Uh, you've got lichen, which grows on trees. Uh, the lichen needs a substrate to be able to grow on, but the tree is not being affected by the lichen. The lichen is not taking nutrients away from the tree. And so the tree is not being uh, positively or negative effectly, negatively affected. Sorry. You also have birds which will nest in trees. Uh, the tree is not affected by the bird or the nest, uh, but the bird definitely needs somewhere to be able to build its nest or hole in the tree that it can, that can enter to put the nest into. Um, and again, if we're following the uh, example of buffaloes, then you've got cattle egrets. Cattle egrets don't necessarily eat ticks directly off the buffalo like the oxpeckers do, but they like to walk around in the grass or sit up on the buffalo's back, as you see here, waiting as the buffalo move through the grass. They disturb a lot of insects um, and other small invertebrates that the cattle egrets can then jump down and, and eat. That is commensalism. And then the final one that we'll look at now, and don't get me wrong, there's various other types of symbiotic relationships. And within each one of these, there's different types of commensalism, different types of mutualism. Um, this is a very simplistic view. Um, parasitism is now, I think, a concept that most people would understand is that you've got an organism that benefits to the detriment of Another, um, now a tick living on a buffalo is, is obviously a parasite. This is quite different from predation. Obviously a lion killing an impala is one organism benefiting to the detriment of another, but the purpose of that lion killing that impala is, is you know, it, it needs to kill that impala to be able to, to eat it. Whereas with a tick, the tick needs to keep the buffalo alive for long enough that it can continue to feed and stay alive for long enough to then to be able to find a mate, reproduce, um, and live out its entire life cycle. Depending on the species of tick, it may live on one animal, two, or three different animals over the course of its lifetime. Um, so the parasite doesn't want to kill its host outright, whether it's a tapeworm in the stomach, or a tick living on the external surface, or a mite. Uh, the goal is not to kill the host outright, but it will negatively affect the host. Okay. Other types of relationships which would ne not necessarily be symbiotic. Um, you've got predation, I mentioned. You've got a predator that's killing prey as quickly as possible. Sometimes a predator may be smaller than the prey. Uh, in the case of a lion killing a buffalo, for instance, or a small goshawk killing a big guinea fowl, uh, but quite often the predator is larger than the prey. You've got a martial eagle, which is uh, with, a, with a monitor lizard prey on a tree. Uh, you've got interspecific competition. Okay, this is where you have two different species, completely different species, competing for the same food source or water. Um, here you've got impala, oh, sorry, uh, hyena and leopard competing over a dead impala. They will fight over it. This is one of the main reasons why leopards like to take their food up into the trees so that they don't have this competition. They don't have to worry about lions and, and hyenas st stealing their food. Um, you can even have livestock and wildebeest competing for the same food source. It's not always predators. Uh, you can have different types of insects competing for the same food source. That's all still interspecific competition. You won't have leopards and hyenas fighting over the same territory. Uh, their territories may overlap, but their territories are for completely different things. And so 
they, there's no reason for them to fight over it. They don't even recognize the sig signals of each other's territories. You won't find them fighting over females. You won't find them fighting over anything else. It's primarily food source and water is what two species may compete over. Intraspecific competition now is the other type where you've got two individuals of the same species which compete for food, territory, mating, etc. So here you've got two male impalas, young males which are fighting each other. Again, this is probably just sparring. Their horns are not very large. So these two are probably part of a, a bachelor herd where they are testing their strength. They're building up their, their fighting skills. When they get old enough and their horns are large enough and they know how to fight well, one of them will now go and uh, try and outcompete a male who has a harem, uh, which we'll get to in a few slides. And he'll try and take over the females from that harem. Okay. Um, they can fight over food, they can fight over territory, they can fight over mating rights, uh, unlike interspecific competition where you're only com competing over food and water. I hope this is clear. Okay, let's talk about some social groupings. Again, this is focused primarily on mammals, and these are some groupings mostly of large mammals that you might find out in a savanna ecosystem. Um, it's not really getting into a lot of detail for some of the smaller, smaller mammals, the rodents and the bats, which may have slightly different social grouping and social structures. Okay, the first one we'll look at is solitary animals. Animals which basically live by themselves, sleep by themselves, feed by themselves, and will then come together, male and female will come together to mate, and then you may find a female with her young ones tagging along. But once the young ones are old enough, they will go off on their own to, to live life by themselves. So generally, animals which live by themselves are solitary. Knees, uh, there's plenty of examples of this. Leopards are good examples. White-tailed mongoose that I've got here on the right is a good example of this. Uh, sometimes you will see two or three white-tailed mongoose together. Um, they're not completely asocial. They will still come together and meet and, and interact with each other. Uh, but most of the time, the majority of the time, they're living by themselves. Uh, you have a pair or like a monogamous pair. Um, I think most people, for a lot of, for a lot of uh, safari guides especially, uh, when people think of a, a monogamous animal, they think of dick dicks. So I've got that here. Um, there's several different species of dick dicks across the continent. Uh, they're all monogamous. They breed once they've once they are sexually mature. They will find a mate and they will stay with that mate for the rest of their life. Um, there's a lot of myths around this. Some people believe that if one of those dick dicks dies, the other one will either commit suicide or just die of depression. Uh, there is no evidence to show that they do that. Uh, in general, if they are still within sexual, within their sexual maturity, within the, their lifespan, sorry, if they are still sexually active, they will be able to find another mate and carry on with life after that. Um, you may also have some animals which are, which will be monogamous for one particular breeding season that they will find a mate for one breeding season, that a lot of birds will do this, and they will, the, the male and female will build a nest, and it's just the two of them, and they will then lay their eggs and rear the chicks, and then in a year's time, maybe it's the next breeding season, then that male may find a different female, uh, but for that one breeding season, they were monogamous, and that is different from birds which will find several different, a male which will find several different females within that one breeding season. I hope that's clear. Uh, you've got family groups. A good example of this is wild dogs, African wild dogs in a family group. And this is a loose term. I, I think there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of different social groupings could be called family groups. You could also call this cooperative breeders where you have a monogamous pair, and then you've got other related animals of the same species which stick around 
to help provide food for the young from that monogamous pair. In the case of wild dogs, if another pair, another male and female within a pack mates, while the alpha male and female have cubs or pups, sorry, uh, quite often those, those two non-alpha male and female will get booted out from the pack because now there's just going to be too many mouths to feed. Uh, and so they need to be able to, the, the, the primary alpha male and female need to make sure that whoever's in the pack with them is focusing on helping to raise their pups. You'll see this with jackals as well. Jackals kind of move up and down between the pair and the family social grouping. Um, a lot of the time you'll see only two jackals. Sometimes the jackals pups will stick around for one or two breeding seasons afterwards, even if, even if they're adult and will help their parents to raise the next litter or two. So they then kind of move back and forth between those. You'll see this with um, helmet shrikes, you'll see it with uh, oxpeckers and various other birds as well, or you would call that cooperative breeding. Okay, uh, the next one is a harem. I mentioned this earlier with impala. You've got a dominant male with several females and the young from those females. Uh, the male will try to hold on to those females for as long as possible. He will try to mate with as many of them as possible before another male, usually from a bachelor herd, comes and tries to oust him. Uh, in the case of Impala, if he's ousted, then he goes into that bachelor herd and he will start from the bottom of the ladder and have to work his way back up to the top. The longer he stays, uh, holding on to his harem, the weaker he becomes because he spends so much time chasing after females, rounding them up, making sure there's no other males around, uh, mating with them, that he's not actually doing a lot of feeding. He is certainly not honing his fighting skills. He's not gaining that strength that all the other males are doing in the bachelor herd. In the bachelor herd, their primary goal is eat, bulk up, fight, learn how to fight properly. So by the time one of them comes over to take over from him, he's usually a little bit weakened. Um, so he needs to try and mate with as many females as possible as quickly as he can before he gets pushed out. A good, another example of animals that live in a harem structure would be uh, plains or common zebra. Okay, a lot of animals live within a matriarchal structure. Many, many animals live within a matriarchal structure. Um, but for whatever reason, we think we only really think of elephants as they be as big matriarchal. Um, I think the term was primarily coined by uh, Cynthia Moss in, in Amboseli when she began to really fully understand how elephants uh, are, how their groups are structured and how they behave. Uh, but since then, we've begun, we've also begun to understand that for many other species and realize that uh, giraffes are also matriarchal. And if you really think about it, lions are matriarchal as well, uh, where you have a dominant female or female led, it may not be a single female, but it's a female led group, usually of related individuals. And when a male gets old enough, he becomes a problem. And so he gets booted out. Uh, with elephants, usually if the, once the male gets to be, be between 13 to 15 years old, he gets booted out and he now needs to go and find another male, a big bull that he can shadow and follow because at 13 or 15 years old, he's still not very experienced. He still needs to be able to uh, learn where to find the best food, where to find water in a drought situation. And he can do that by following um, an older male. What you're left with then is the female group of mothers, daughters, sisters, cousins, and, and very young ones. And it's usually in the case of elephants, it's led by the oldest, wisest uh, female. And so this is a system which is sort of based on love and respect, if we're going to anthropomorphize them. Um, whereas if you look at hyenas, hyenas are much more 
their social structure is more, much more of a dominatrix social structure rather than this sort of benevolent, loving, uh, motherly kind of relationship. You've got a, a queen at the top who kind of rules with an iron fist and dominance within the within spotted hyenas is passed on it's it's hereditary so a female the oldest female cub of the dominant female will be the one to take her place when she dies um, so within hyenas there'll be a little bit of jostling position uh, jostling for position from the females within each litter um, but the males the highest ranking male is lower than the lowest ranking female within spotted hyena structure. Um, anyway, lots of different species fit within that matriarchal female led groups and then males being separate. Um, in the news, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of mention of oligarchs from a particular country in uh, countries in Europe and, and Asia. Um, oligarchs are a group of males that have control over society. In the case in the animal kingdom, a classic example would be olive baboons, yellow baboons. In southern Africa, you've got your chakma baboons. Um, they live in an oligarchical structure. You don't have one single dominant male. You have several dominant males who kind of make decisions for the group, where they're going to sleep at night, where they're going to forage today. Um, how to handle predators and other dangers. They are the ones that get preferential rights for mating. Um, and any other male that tries to usurp their position before their time will get, uh, will get really violently pushed back down. Um, within the females, there will still also be a social uh, a hierarchy, but it's much more, it's much more loose. And females tend to associate with those that are related with, with them. So you'll have daughters associating with their mothers and their aunts, whereas the males tend to become much more independent once they get old enough. Uh, vervet monkeys are not quite in that oligarchical structure, although it's similar. You do tend to have more dominant males, slightly less dominant males. Uh, but otherwise, the rest of the structure is quite similar. One more slide of uh, social groupings. You have something called an arena or lek. This is a temporary uh, grouping of males, which will come together in a central area or a, a visible area to show off to females during the breeding season. I've got a picture here of a topi standing on top of a termite mound that is classic uh, Masemara Serengeti uh, imagery that you see. They do this to be able to show off to the females and show how large they are. The bigger the termite mount, obviously, the more impressive they look. You'll see this with carpenter bees as well. The male carpenter bees will all come together and they will sort of have these little mini dog fights in the air as they, as they fly around showing off to the females. The, the male carpenter bees are sort of a drab, brownish golden color, whereas the females are actually the really brightly colored uh, black with yellow stripes or white stripes on them. You'll also see this with uh, widow birds. Jackson's widow bird here in East Africa is a classic example where you see lots and lots of males with their big long tails coming together and they will flatten a bunch of grass in a long grassy area or in a wheat field, and then they will hop up and down and show off to the females. And the females look at that dance and they, from looking at that dance, they can decide which male is the most impressive, which one is the best candidate to, um, for them to mate with, to be able to pass on their genes. That is an arena or a lek. And finally, the last one that we'll talk about here, certainly not the last type of social structure within the animal kingdom, but what we'll talk about here is a caste system. Um, this is really a complex system, and the most complex probably would be the termites, where you have a queen, you'll have a, a king, um, you may have additional queens, which are sort of backups, you'll have soldiers to protect the hive or the, to protect the, the nest, 
and you'll have workers. But within that worker class, you'll also have different uh, different roles that they're born into. So you'll have some whose primary role is to tend the queen. You'll have others whose primary role is specifically to tend the the eggs that the queen produces and they have a nursery and they feed the young ones and make sure that they grow up that they're protected you have others whose primary role is a uh, collection of food and then still others whose primary role is construction and maintenance of the nest and maintenance of the temperature within the nest they're constantly opening and closing passageways for airflow uh, so the caste system is an extremely complex system. The, if a, one individual will be born into their role, there's no upward or downward movement within that society. They're born into it, you stay within it, and you die in that role. Um, if you're born a, a worker, you will always be a worker. Um, um, it's difficult not to anthropomorphize some of the, the structures that we see. But it's, it's important that we keep that to a minimum and we don't start to make judgments on how other animals live using our own human societal morals. Okay, so animals need to communicate with each other, obviously, for various reasons. Um, they may communicate with sound, and that sound can be both vocal, non vocal. Uh, we are obviously familiar with a lot of birds. In the morning, a lot of birds will, will start singing. This is what we, we call the dawn chorus. The males are the ones who sit out in a prominent place and they start singing loudly and as beautifully as they can to establish, to reestablish their territory every day, but also to reestablish their dominance or to, to show off to the females, hey, look, here I am. Why don't you come and have a look? Uh, you've got frogs which do very much the same thing and toads which will come together in a particular area and they will all start calling one at a time in order for the females to hear them. Non-vocal non -vocal sound communication can involve rubbing of antlers against bushes, it can involve uh, bill snapping with some of the birds, it can involve um, various other methods with insects. You've got stridulation where the insects may rub rough parts of their body together to create a grating sound. All of that is non-vocal. Okay. And those may be the sounds that the that animals create may be either to, to mark territory, to attract females, or as an alarm. You've got visual displays. I've got a picture here of, of a Nyala from Southern Africa. Uh, they will raise up the hairs on the back and around the, the underside to make the animal look bigger. Uh, you'll get two males which will walk next to each other and they size each other up uh, when they're also trying to attract the female they'll do that you get animals which will use visual various visuals to scare off predators uh, there's a lot of interesting images on the internet of uh, caterpillars moth caterpillars which look remarkably like a boom slum uh, you know a venomous snake or look remarkably like an, an owl's face for some of the moths uh, and this is visual communication do not touch me. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of that in a couple of slides. With mammals, one of the most important forms of communication is olfactory communication, chemical or scent communication. A lot of mammals have various scent glands in different parts of their bodies. They have extremely well-developed um, methods of being able to read scent and, and read the messages. That, or that are being uh, placed within those scent glands. There's a picture here of a spotted hyena leaving a, a secretion from the anal sac um, on a stalk of grass. That message will, there's lots of messages in there, which is who is the individual who's doing it? Is it a male or a female? If it's a female, is she on heat? What sort of, uh, what sort of age is she? Is she sexually mature? Uh, is she healthy or unhealthy? What social status does she have in society? Is she dominant or is she or is she more of a is she lower ranking? All of that can be picked up by the other hyenas who might pass by and smell that. And because hyenas have an extremely good sense of smell, 
they're able to pick up those scents from a long way away, and then they can get in closer to pick up the, the finer subtleties of those messages. Um, we see this with lots of antelopes. You'll see that they have glands between their between their hooves, or you'll see it on the front of a dictic's face. They've got that little gland in front of their eye. That's called a preorbital gland, which they use to make a, leave secretions on stalks of grass and and sticks to mark their territory. A lot of animals will use urine and dung to be able to leave a particular scents for other other animals of the same species to pick up. Olfactory communication is so much more important than we can potentially even realize because as humans, we've kind of lost that. Um, and it's, it's less and less uh, important for apes because for apes and primates, uh, we, we tend to use sight, smell, and touch a lot more. Whereas with other animals, they tend to use uh, olfactory communication a lot more. Uh, and lastly, you've got tactile communication. Tactile is now the communication through touch. And there's a classic, you know, lions are, lions are very, very communicative through touch. Uh, two, you've got two female lionesses that have been sleeping during the day and they wake up in the evening at 5.30 in the evening and they start walking around. One of the first things that they'll do is they'll go up to each other and they'll start licking each other, they'll grunt. They'll rub their faces against each other. They'll play with each other. They'll touch paws with each other. It's all part of communicating to each other that they love each other, that they care for each other, that they are still there together, um, and that they are. Um, there's lots of messages being passed back and forth between them in that, including some scent which gets rubbed off of them from the saliva as they lick. Okay. Uh, an important uh, part of animal behavior is grooming. We see animals which will groom themselves. This can be done individually. This is just classic looking at your, looking at yourself and removing ticks and other parasites. Uh, for birds, you're, you're grooming, you're preening your feathers to take care of your feathers. The feathers are the most important thing for keeping you warm, allowing you to fly, uh, protecting your eggs when you're sitting on the nest. So you need to care for your feathers and just general cleaning. Uh, but you can also see it socially, as we see here in this image with these two baboons. Um, this is called allo grooming. Allo just means social or doing it to each other. If you see allo suckling with lions, for instance, lion females, lionesses will allow the cubs of other females to suckle them as long as they are, uh, as long as they are still lactating. Um, so that's aloe, that's aloe suckling with birds. If you find two birds which are preening each other, that's called aloe preening. In the case of general grooming, it's called aloe, aloe grooming. It still has the same purpose of removing parasites and general cleaning, but it also helps to strengthen social bonds. And within complex societies like with baboons and chimpanzees and monkeys, it means that animals can strategically form alliances to help them move up that uh, hierarchical chain. Let's quickly just look at uh, the differences between territories and home range. I don't want to spend too long on this, but these two words kind of get interchanged a little bit, but they are, they are different concepts and it's important to understand the difference. Territories generally don't overlap. Some animals, so, an important thing to remember is that all animals have a home range. Some animals are territorial, not all of them are territorial, but all animals have a home range that they use. Home range is basically just a large area that serves the animal's needs for finding food and other resources that they, that they require. Uh, territory do not, ter two territories of the same species will not overlap. So, Lions are territorial, leopards are territorial. They will mark their territories around the boundaries and they will defend those territories quite uh, violently if need be to ensure that the male of the neighboring territory doesn't come into their territory to access females, food, or any other resources that they may be defending. Territories are generally smaller than a home range um, and they, you may be able, animals may leave their territory and still use the outer limits of their, of their home range as long as they don't uh, 
interfere with another animal's territory of the same species. Some territories are permanent. Um, quite often, uh, like leopards, for instance, once they are sexually mature, they will find an area, they'll be able to set up a territory, and they will remain in that territory until they die. Wildebeest, on the other hand, especially those which are uh, migratory here in the, in the Mara Serengeti ecosystem, will set up very, very temporary territories. Uh, they, those territories could last for a couple of days or even a few hours uh, just to be able to fend off other males, attract females, mate quickly, and the next day they're on the move again because they've got to get to the next patch of good grass. So territories don't necessarily have to be permanent. Uh, whereas home ranges are basically lifelong. They don't change uh, unless there's major, major drought and then an animal might be forced to move to a new area or some human interference, perhaps. Elephants are non-territorial. Elephants have very, very large home ranges. Traditionally, as long as there's no fencing and there's no constriction, elephants can move over massive, massive distances, over hundreds of kilometers, and over the course of a year, over thousands of kilometers, if need be, uh, which is very different from lions and leopards, for instance. Okay, um, we'll finish up with a couple of slides on adaptations that animals may employ to protect themselves from predators. Um, I've got a couple of images, but a few more examples above. So I don't have an image here, but for mimicry, this is where two animals will, or one animal will try to mimic another animal, either by the way it looks or by the way it behaves. Um, classic example of this is the African monarch butterfly, which is a poisonous butterfly. As a larva, the butterfly feeds on uh, poisonous plants like the milkweed. And when it pupates and comes out as an adult with wings, it remains with that poison in the body. Now, the, the colors on an African monarch butterfly are orange and black with some white spots. When a bird sees that, uh, if a bird was ever to try and take a bite out of, out of an African monarch butterfly, first of all, even as an adult, the, the body of the, of the butterfly is still hard. And so the bird would take a bite, get a foul taste in its mouth from that poison, release the butterfly and carry on. Butterfly then, because it's now not damaged, uh, is able to continue, find a mate and produce young. That's not mimicry. That is an animal which is dangerous and uh, and actually has poison. But there is another butterfly called the African diadem and the female African diadem mimics, has evolved to look just like the African monarch butterfly. And in each area in Africa, the African diadems will look slightly different because there's different subspecies of African monarchs. And so the diadems have to adapt and look just like their local species of, of African monarch. So now when a bird has tasted that African monarch and knows that that animal is, is poisonous and foul tasting, it will then fly along. Maybe it sees a diadem flying along in the same flight pattern, with the same colors on the wings, the same patterns on the wing. And the bird will say, ah, I'm not gonna touch that because I know that they are foul. Um, so that's mimicry. That's one type of mimicry that's called uh, malarian mimicry. It's also Batesian mimicry, which is the opposite now where you have two species which are poisonous and both of them look like each other. So they are strengthening that message of, of danger. Okay. Uh, there's also some good evidence to show that cheetah cubs mimic a, they mimic the fearsome or the, the greatly feared um, honey badger. Cheetah cubs have dark fur on the side. They have light colored long fur on the top of their back. And when they move through long grass, they can look like a honey badger, which most animals know that they really shouldn't mess with. Um, I struggled with this one for a long time. I, I felt it was a bit of a stretch that that would be mimicry. But I have seen cheetah cubs moving through long grass in the early morning and with the sun behind them, it really, really does look like a honey badger. Um, and if I was a predator out there, I would think twice about going and attacking those cheetah cubs because honey badgers just have such a reputation. Uh, 
There's lots and lots of examples of mimicry out there. We could go on for a very long time. Autotomy, this is a, a technical term for basically self-mutilation. You've got example, the ex classic example would be geckos and skinks, which are able to jettison part of their body, usually the tail, um, in order to escape from a predator. If a predator is about to catch them or has already caught them, they're able to release that tail, escape, and the tail will continue to move, distracting the predator while the lizard is able to move away. Some of them are able to grow tail back like the geckos. Some of them, if they lose part of their tail, like an agama lizard, for instance, it's not able to grow that tail back, uh, but perhaps it's able to escape from a predator and that's good enough for the time. Okay, you've got thanatosis, which is basically playing dead. Uh, example here that I've got is a snake, a relative of the cobras, which is called the wrinkles. Um, we don't get them up here in East Africa, but we do have other snakes which play dead. We have mammals which play dead. The Egyptian uh, mongoose is a good example. Lots of beetles and lots of other insects will also play dead when they feel threatened by a predator. Um, I have watched it several times with beetles where you'll see a beetle moving along the trail and I come in close to take a picture of it with my camera and the beetle just drops over dead. And I can pick it up and I can hold it in my hand and I can sort of maneuver the feet around a little bit and it's totally, totally dead. And it's very, very convincing. I'll take my pictures and I'll put the beetle back down and I'll stand back a few meters and wait for a minute or two. And eventually it'll get up and walk away. Um, they're totally fine. But the, the primary, the theory being that most predators are not really interested in eating a, an already dead animal which has died of unknown, unnatural causes. If you were to throw a dead sheep out of a window to a cheetah, uh, that cheetah would very likely not go and eat that sheep. Um, whereas if you were to, if a hyena was to kill an impala and started eating it, and then a lion was to come along, that lion is very aware of the fact that that uh, impala has been, been killed and started to be eaten by that hyena. And so the lion has no problem uh, taking on that, that impala and stealing that kill from the hyenas. Um, so that's a slightly different situation. But in many situations, predators are not interested in eating a fully, a, a whole dead animal that's died of unnatural causes or unknown causes. Uh, you've got plenty of animals which have armor uh, in the mammal kingdom or in the mammal world, sorry, you've got uh, porcupines, you've got pangolins. Uh, in other parts of the world, you've got armadillos and other species which have hard armor plating on the outside. Uh, within the insect world, uh, insects are covered in a hard exoskeleton, which is made out of a substance called chitin. Some insects have harder exoskeletons than others. That is all good armor. A lot of reptiles have good armor. Obviously, the, the, the tortoises, terrapins, and, uh, and turtles have a big shell that protects their most vulnerable parts. Um, and a lot of the lizards have large, hard plates Crocodiles have those hard osteoderms, the hard plates, scales on the outside. That is all armor, protects them from predators. Uh, plenty of species have chemical defense. A lot of insects have uh, poisonous or caustic liquid that they're able to spray or to sting with. Um, you've got uh, spitting cobras. The spitting action that cobras do is purely defense. They won't use that spitting to actually subdue prey. It's only a self-defense mechanism. So that is a, they'll, they'll bite their prey using the same venom, uh, but the spitting that they do that we're also afraid of is actually just self-defense. Okay, uh, I've kind of mentioned aposematism. Aposematism is danger colors. The example that I've got here is a blister beetle, uh, which is a black beetle with orange or yellow spots on the back. Any insect that you see which has got black, some combination of black, orange, black, orange, and white, or black and yellow and white, uh, generally that means don't touch me, I'm dangerous. And blister beetles are able to release a substance called cantharidin, which 
uh, creates nasty blisters on your skin. Some of them are able to spray it quite far. Uh, in East Africa, we've got, the, there's a beetle here, which is notorious, which is called the Nairobi eye. Um, and they produce a different kind of chemical, which is called paterin, which has a very similar action. And they are black and red. Each body segment is either black or red in, in uh, alternate colors. Um, some of the big, some of the big uh, assassin bugs have very clear aposmatic colors. So aposematism is danger colors. It can be argued that uh, zorillas and some of the other mustelids like the honey badger also have aposmatic colors. In the mammal world, bright colors are not so important because a lot of mammals don't see in bright color. They see, they are dichromat, so they see it's like their, their color vision is muted. Um, and so your black and white tends to be more the, the combination that you'll see in the mammal kingdom, uh, in, the, in the mammal world, sorry. And, and as I mentioned earlier, honey badgers are not to be messed with. So when you see that combination of black and white running through the grass, people, uh, most predators will know that they need to back off. You've got startle displays. These are uh, prey animals which will use bright colors, suddenly enlarging themselves, sudden bright flashes, as they jump up from the grass to startle a predator. Um, they may also use a lot of moths will have eyes on their wings, which will perhaps look like a large predator, like an owl's eyes. Um, there's lots of ways that uh, something can scare off a predator, either using a large sound, or, uh, sorry, a loud sound or bright colors all of a sudden and then suddenly disappearing. The example I've got here is a, a praying mantis with brightly colored wings. Um, once that praying mantis feels the danger is gone, those wings will close and it will disappear very well camouflaged amongst the grass. Distraction displays. Um, this is where one animal will, will try to distract a predator away from another. I usually parents distracting a predator away from its, its young or dis distracting a predator away from its nest where there may be eggs. So here you've got a crowned club or crowned lapwing, which is distracting a, an Egyptian mongoose, oh, sorry, a, a slender mongoose away from its eggs. And what they'll do is they'll pretend that they are injured and they'll put on this very, very convincing display because a predator is looking for the weakest and easiest prey. And an injured bird is a great, uh, is a great candidate for that. So a, a small predator like a slender mongoose is going to love the idea that there's an injured lapwing around and it's going to follow that lapwing far, far away from the lapwing's nest. And just at the last second, when the lapwing is convinced that the mongoose is far enough away from the nest, the lapwing will take off and fly away, leaving the, the mongoose completely bewildered. Um, mobbing is an important one that we see, especially with birds. When birds find a snake in a tree, Lots of different species of birds. You may get weavers and drongos and bulbuls and all sorts of things all coming together and attacking this, this snake. And some of them will physically attack the snake and peck it and bite it and try and scare the snake off because the snake is, is a danger to them, but specifically it's a danger to their, to their eggs or to their chicks in the nest. Um, you'll see this with, with herbivores out on the open plain as well. You'll see zebras and wildebeest and topi all going up and mobbing a cheetah in the open plain. And they'll be stomping their feet and they'll be snorting and making lots of loud noise, kicking up a lot of dust to show to the cheetah that you, you, you have been seen, the element of surprise has been lost, um, and we know that you're here and there's more of us than you, so you better just move off. Um, and eventually the cheetah will take notice and will move away. Doesn't work as well with lions, uh, but the zebras and the wildebeest will definitely still try that with lions. Um, and then, of course, there's camouflage. Camouflage is a great anti predator adaptation. The more camouflaged you are, the harder you are to be seen. Um, and the classic uh, mammalian example would be bushbuck. Uh, bushbuck are common, they're, they're, they're everywhere. But if you're out on a, on a wildlife drive or, or a survey looking for um, looking for herbivores, bushbuck are often difficult to see because when they see 
something which they perceive as danger, they will freeze. And the coloration of their coat, that reddish brownish coloration with little white spots looks like dappled sunlight coming through a forest. And as long as they freeze and they don't move, it's very difficult for us and for predators to be able to see them. And so they will stay frozen until they feel like it's just too close. And then they'll bolt, they'll get behind a bush and they'll freeze again. So the predator can no longer keep track of their movement. Okay, there's lots more to go over here. Um, and I could go on for a very long time about various other things. Um, I hope I have covered some interesting topics and given a bit of a, a background that people can start to sort of or base that people can, that you can all begin to learn a little bit more from. So are there any questions? <coughs> Zarek, just first of all, thank you very much. That was a um, very, very useful framework for, for us to understand um, the ecosystems and it's, yeah fascinating discussion um i would just like to ask everybody to use the reaction tools at the bottom of the screen to draw our attention or place questions in the chat um no such thing as a stupid question so please go ahead and ask your questions um i see sharon jones has got a hand up uh please go ahead and ask your question Uh, thank you, Johan, and uh, thank you, Zarek, for that uh, very extensive talk on ecosystem function. Uh, on behalf of my students at uh, Africa Nazarene University, I just want to say thank you uh, for, for sharing that. Uh, I just I wanted to bring to attention that we have students who are undertaking biodiversity management in your talk who have been listening. And I wanted to ask your opinion uh, when it comes to the topic of biodiversity management. Would you have an approach that you think is um, that will cover all species from the top uh, bottom, or do you feel like uh, there are approaches where if you focus on the one species and uh, managing that species and the rest of the ecosystem? will uh, benefit and i'm speaking um about your 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 the, the part of your talk where you're talking about um keystone spe species and the like and then also generalist species as well so i just wanted to hear your thoughts on that uh, thank you uh, thanks very much sharon um i can't say that this is my area of expertise. I'm not, a, I'm not a land manager or conservationist by training, but in my experience, um, managing an ecosystem holistically is a much better way to, to manage biodiversity or to increase biodiversity. If you're gonna be looking at, just looking at elephants alone, um, it's very easy to get bogged down into the little details of the elephants and forget about all sorts of other things that are living there from, from the insects to the plants, to the diversity of the plants. Um, and I, I'm gonna let some of my personal opinions come out here. I, I feel like in Kenya, we spend a little bit too much time focusing on charis large charismatic species. And we spend a lot of money and resources protecting large charismatic species with very little uh, focus on general ecosystem health. And, in, and because of that, we are completely blind to things like uh, erosion, degradation of, of uh, or, or depletion of rare plant species and introduction of invasive plant species, which are a, a huge threat to some of our, our ecosystems here in Kenya, um, because all we can see is elephants, sometimes rhinos, and rarely elephant, uh, rarely lions, and everything else is like whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I can, sorry if I'm, I, I, can, I could go on for a long time. I think, I think the most important thing would be um, management of an ecosystem holistically that you're looking at the whole thing, you're making sure that the whole thing is healthy. And by doing that, you are able to then conserve all biodiversity within that area and using whatever tools you have at your disposal for each 
aspect of that ecosystem. Um, that's it. I think I could go for a lot longer, but I'm going to stop myself there. So I, I hope that somewhat answers your question. Uh, thank you, Zarek. Yes, it does. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, I, I have another follow up question to that. Um, I agree with some of your opinions. Uh, on the weekend, I met uh, a wildlife artist who uh, told me that he focuses his work on uh, these big charismatic uh, species you are talking about because those are the ones that sell for, by the tourists. And uh, even, you know, he, he, he's very capable of doing small things like impala or zebra, but he doesn't bother simply because they don't sell. So I just, I wanted to, again, pick your mind. Um, because of the holistic approach you've, you've just spoken about, which I agree with, is there a way to be able to promote such species or even um, manage them or bring them to the forefront so that they are deemed as just as important as the charismatic ones? It's, it's a bit, it's, it, you don't have to go into too much depth. I just, I, I just wanted to ask that as well, thanks. Okay, thanks for that. And and yeah, this is something I struggle with. Um, it is very difficult. Um, you know, if I'll give an example, my, my partner used to work for BirdLife International, and she was working on uh, vulture conservation, Af the African Vulture Conservation Program for BirdLife International, and getting anybody from donors to the general public to look at vultures in a positive light and to actually care about the plight of vultures. By the way, we've lost about between 85 to 95% of all the vultures within, uh, within Africa over the last 30 years. That's a major thing, that's big. And ecologically, that's a huge deal if you lose vultures. Um, it's, it's a huge deal for public health uh, that you'll suddenly have an increase in zoonotic diseases, which is being spread uh, via, via rats and feral dogs and, and other scavengers. Um, and the government's going to have to spend, you know, millions or, or billions more shillings every year on, on public health with things like rabies and anthrax. But getting people to care about vultures, because everybody has this very negative view of them, oh, they're ugly and oh, they're dirty, it's very difficult. Um, so, you know, getting people to care about zebras and to care about insects and, and everything else is, it's a challenge because the public and the donors which fund these things, I'm, I'm afraid to say, are fickle. And even for me as a safari guide, if I want to, if I want to sell safaris and I want to put things on social media um, in order to attract people to, to come to my website, I'm going to put up lions and leopards and cheetahs rather than putting up dung beetles and and birds because that's what's going to attract people to my social media. Unfortunately, I'm not very good at that because I like all the other stuff too much. Um, so I end up putting up things that people are not that interested in. Um, and I notice that my the number of likes are just lower. I, I honestly I don't know how to solve that problem. It's <laughs> it's a little bit beyond me and my level of expertise. Can I come in there a little bit, Zarek, because you're quite right in it and it's super difficult, but I also want to come in on your last question, Sharon, that, you know, I think it's part of the job now of parents at home and institutions to really show the children and the students where things are important and things like, for example, there's an amazing um, podcast called Mammal Watching where there is absolute fascination with mammals as small as rats and mice to all sorts of things. And to really build up your knowledge of how to identify things, how to get involved with things. You know, competition creates desire. So can you be the student who knows the most number of, of vermin species? And I use the word vermin, which I shouldn't, rodents, rodents you know, um, that these are super important things. And to remember that there's wildlife wherever you are. So, you know, when you do a study project, do you really want to go out and study cheetahs or lions or great white sharks? You know, surely there's a place for you to study 
wildlife in your urban areas you know birds of prey where are they nesting or you know again what's the link with the number of rodents and the number of green spaces or things like that so you know the other thing that I think is coming to the fore in protecting areas and why do we have megafauna as our sort of focus species it's obviously because they're charismatic but things like mycorrhizal networks and the function of them in our ecosystems is becoming so clear how critical this is and there's a really good website called spun s-p-u-n which is the society for the protection of underground networks and this is amazing because the work they're doing is to say, okay, let's create a protected area based on the mycorrhizal network, because that will bring back biodiversity. Um, and grasslands and forests all have different types of mycorrhizal networks. So I think we're just learning more as well. Um, sorry, Zarek, if you want to add anything in there, please do. No, that's perfect. Thanks, Holly. Thanks for jumping in. Um, Zarek, I see there's a question in the chat at the moment from Lucy. Uh, why is it that baboons carry their dead kids? Yeah, I've just seen that. Um, thanks, Lucy. Um, it's, you mentioned that other species would try to bury other than humans. I'm, I'm not really aware that other species would necessarily bury their, their dead. Um, but, and, and it's also not only baboons that would carry their dead, uh, there's other species that do as well. Chimpanzees, gorillas, a lot of the apes and, and other primates will hold on to a dead young one for a while. And there seems to be a recognition of loss of, of a family member, certainly a loss of a baby, of, if it's a mother will hold on to its young one. She's unwilling to give it up. Um, it's, it's, it, it varies depending on the intelligence of a species, depending on the social structure of that species. Uh, you're not going to find an impala spending too long over a dead baby impala. Uh, you know, the mother is not going to spend too long over it because if it's died, it's usually been killed by a predator. And if the mother hangs around for too long, she's going to be killed as well. Um, and in species like impala, where they are fast reproducing, uh, they will they would rather allow a young one to die than put themselves in too much danger. Because if if they die, the young one's going to die anyway. Um, because the young, it's not going to have its its parents to care for, its mother to care for it. But if the young one dies, then the mother will survive, and she can then always have another young one later on. Um, and so. In terms of in terms of adaptation for survival of an, an entire species, that works very well. Um, when it comes to primates, their intelligence level is very different. Their relationship with their young one is very different, um, and they have a much stronger bond. And they are not as fast reproducing. They don't have that same um, what's the word instinct of self-preservation and so when a young one dies especially if it's something like disease or if maybe an older male has killed a young one out of anger or rather than anger but out of ire um, then that mother will hold on to it i don't think it's extremely well understood and it's very easy for you know i i am putting an anthropomorphic spin on it i think that we are kind of looking at it from a from a human perspective and and from our the way that we would handle something um, and that's easier to do with primates because they are so similar to us. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have a, an excellent answer to that. Sorry. Thanks, Zarek. Um, just returning to the keystone species, I love the fact that you mentioned termites as a, as a keystone species. Are there any other um, examples of keystone species that are that we overlook because we, we we tend to look at the megafauna as as you mentioned as as keystone species. But any others that you would like to mention um, that we should value that we are not valuing at the moment? Uh, thanks, Johan. Um, I think you know there's 
there's a range. Um, and because I love all biodiversity, I could make a case for pretty much anything. Um, but one, one example might be, might be bees in general, not, and I realize that's not one species, you know, in just so they like for everyone here in East Africa, we have over 900 different species of bees. Um, and so bees in general are very important, as I mentioned, as, as pollinators. Um, and if you were to lose bees, that would have a massive effect on the health of an ecosystem and have a massive effect on our agriculture as well. You know, it's, it's estimated that over one third or one in every three bites of food is directly, is directly thanks to a pollinator. Um, another one third is indirectly thanks to a pollinator. If you think about beef, for instance, if you, if you enjoy your steak, um, realize that you're that, and then you enjoy that grass fed beef, that cow has to have eaten grass. That grass was pollinated by a pollinator. It was only able to grow because there was a pollinator. So you are not able to eat beef unless you have bees and flies pollinating the grass. Um, and so, you know, in, in parts of Asia, especially in China, during their during a very dark period in their history, they spent a lot of money and effort getting rid of what they considered to be pests. And they sprayed their crops so much that they got rid of pretty much all of the pollinators for certain crops. And now some of those crops have to be pollinated by hand. And they have armies of workers who climb up orchard into the trees and the orchards and take pollen from one flower and move it to another flower. And that is like ludicrous to me um, when you have animals like bees which can do all of that for you for free um, and so i think we are we are endangering ourselves if we get rid of things like with some some of the pollinators um, but <clears throat> i think this i mean there's like i said you could make a case for anything you could make a case for the wildebeest in the mara serengeti ecosystem being a keystone species uh, that there's you know there's 1.6 million of them Plus, there's another 500,000 zebras and another 250,000 topis and eland and Thompson's gazelles and Grant's gazelles and all of them moving around. You've got almost 2 million animals moving across a landscape over the course of a year. They have a massive, massive effect on that landscape in terms of the amount of dung that they drop, the urine that they drop, the hoof action in the soil, the aeration of the soil, the grass that they graze. Um, you know, the, each one of them is, has a different preference for which species of grass or which, which level of the grass they like is short, long, or, or very long. Um, and if it wasn't for that almost 2 million mammals, large herbivores moving through an ecosystem, um, you wouldn't have anything to break down the hard, long grasses that grew up during the rainy season. Zarek, I'm, I'm going to read this. Uh, Zarek, can you see the question? Yeah, I can. How can we ensure the scientific results, scientific results into policy making? Because most of the time, scientists are not policy and community advocates in conservation. At the same time, you'll find community and policy advocates in conservation are not research scientists or informed at species level. Uh, this is a this is a super important point, and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I don't have an answer to that completely. What is really important is that the people who are put into policy making decision or decision making positions, uh, policy advocates and the community members are given scientific backing that they are given. This is why it's so important for for Kenya and the rest of, of Africa to implement improved education. We need to have better quality scientific education from the from kindergarten all the way up to tertiary education. Um, so that, you know, it's not only the scientists who are scientifically literate. Uh, somebody who is a lawyer should have some scientific literacy uh, because that lawyer could potentially be influencing decisions on, on an ecosystem based on government policy or a community drive to, to, for settlement or for agriculture. Um, so everybody needs to have improved scientific literacy. And that can only happen at a national level, I think, if, if the government and, and the education system is improved to include science 
throughout, um, rather than people specializing so early and leaving science out by the time that they get into secondary school. Um, so that's a major one, uh, but also just from a policy level is making sure that there is a connection, that policy is based on scientific finding um, and that you're not just doing things and then the scientists and the conservationists come out later and say, oh, we, nobody consulted us. Um, we all need to get better at that. Uh, and I, I agree that that's a major issue. I don't know if there's a silver bullet to you know, make that happen and to, to solve that problem. Mm. Zarek, I think um, Dr. Sharon Jones and the other Sharon Joneses um, put you on the spot this morning with some excellent questions. Thank you for the answers um, and really related to the holistic management of, um, of protected land. I think it's a very, very important issue and something that people are often um, not speaking out. Um, yeah, and it's a problem all over Africa. Thank you, yeah, Aziz. And, and, and thanks, Johan, and thanks, Sharon and Aziza. Um, you know, like these questions are really good. And I, I will admit to you, you know, I'm, I'm a safari guide. I'm not a conservationist. Uh, these are questions that I think about and I have discussions with, with scientists and researchers and conservationists and my clients. Uh, so I definitely have considered them, but I'm, I'm also not the expert. Um, I, I think there's other people who are definitely better placed to be able to answer these questions and, and help find solutions to them than myself. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I, I do think where, where, where it's kind of important and, and where safari guides and guiding, uh, guides in general come in is, is the ability to communicate um, uh, regarding science that, that scientists often don't have themselves. Um, the ability to communicate properly um, regarding nature, and um, I think that that's that's where people you're, like yourself make a, a, a very big contribution um, in drawing in the public and policymakers. I, I think it would be so helpful if um, students from different um, disciplines would would be able to to attend sessions like these and understand these basic concepts regarding ecosystems. Um, so yeah, thank you for this morning. We really, really appreciate it. I don't see any further questions. Um, we've almost been here for two hours now. So if there are no further questions, um, I'm going to say thank you very much, Zarek. And um, I look forward to asking you uh, in the future again to, to talk on um, Share Screen Africa. Right. Thank you so much for, for hosting this and thank you very much for asking me along. Uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, thank you all for attending. I hope uh, I've been able to answer some of your questions. I hope I've been able to maybe give you some new things to think about and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the presentations this month. Thank you very much. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you for your questions.